want to say um, before we, we go into this, uh, a very warm welcome to Ernie and Nancy Thompson, who are here visiting from America, but they spent most of their lives serving our churches here in the Court Care Project, including Middleton, um, doing a lot uh, in this area uh, with the camps, with the churches, and everything. So it's wonderful to see you this morning. Thanks. If you ever watch the news, or read the headlines, um, you'll know that this world is definitely full of threatening situations. That's certainly nothing new, but maybe we know it a bit more recently, uh, the, the threat of certainly disease, um, there's threats of, increasing threats of war going on right now, and um, there may be threats personally for you in your personal circumstances, or uh, with people that you love, whether that's sickness or job insecurity or relational trouble or any number of things. But where do we find real security, real confidence when the world can often feel so fragile, so threatening, so dangerous? Well, today in our text in Luke 13, we'll see how Jesus has confidence in the face of a very, very serious threat. And he keeps going. And, and I want us to see how we can have that same confidence that he has if we're living for the same kingdom that Jesus was living for. So let's, um, let's read our text. It's uh, starting in verse 31 of Luke chapter 13. Verse 31 to 35. At that time, some Pharisees came to Jesus and said to him, Leave this place and go somewhere else. Herod wants to kill you. He replied, Go tell that fox, I will keep on driving out demons and healing people today and tomorrow, and on the third day I will reach my goal. In any case, I must press on today and tomorrow and the next day, for surely no prophet can die outside of Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who killed the prophets and stole those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were not willing. Look, your house is left to you desolate. I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Amen. So we see here, Jesus is receiving a warning, a serious warning in verse 31. King Herod wants to kill him. But he responds by saying that he's going to keep going forward anyway, and then we get a, a bit of a glimpse into why, his reason for facing this danger head on. I want us to take a look at those things and also how we can live with that same confidence and purposefulness uh, that Jesus has here. Let's start with the warning in verse 31. Jesus gets this warning from some Pharisees, which shows us that not all Pharisees are against Jesus. Some of them are genuinely trying to help him. And they do that by warning him that he is in real danger from Herod. And how much danger is this? How dangerous is Herod? Well, let's just say this. Herod is used to getting what he wants. This is the same Herod who had John the Baptist put in prison when John the Baptist told him that what he did was wrong. We saw that in chapter 3. But then later he executed John the Baptist because he could. In chapter 9, we saw that. So when Herod wants someone dead, he doesn't need a judge or jury to agree with him. He just gives the order, and it's carried out. So this threat against Jesus is a very high-level threat. It doesn't get much more dangerous than this. The advice of the Pharisees is to warn him, to say, get out of here, go somewhere else. In other words, it's time for you to, to leave. You're a marked man. Herod has an army. Herod has power and authority in this region, in the extreme, and he wants to kill you. But look at Jesus' response then. He says, I will drive, keep on driving out demons and healing today and tomorrow, and on the third day I will reach my goal. He does not adjust his plans. He recognizes the threat. Even more than that, he actually knows that this threat is very legitimate. In fact, he knows that this threat will be carried out. As he points out in verse 33, he says, No prophet can die outside of Jerusalem. Jesus knows that he will die in Jerusalem too. 
just like the prophets before him. These friendly Pharisees are correct, they're right. Herod does want to kill him, and he's not the only one. There are many powerful people lined up wanting to kill Jesus, and Jesus knows that they actually will succeed. But he also knows something else. When Pilate was about to give the order to have Jesus crucified, John 19 records, Pilate said to him, Do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? And Jesus answered, You would have no authority over me if it were not given to you from above. Pilate was the governor, but his authority over Jesus was not ultimate. Neither was Herod's. His authority was over Pilate, but it was not ultimate. Any authority these two men enjoyed and any others came to them from above, Jesus says. So no matter how high human power and authority gets, it never reaches above God's throne. Jesus knew that all of Herod's power and authority, all of the accumulated power and authority of all the other leaders who wanted him dead, all that power and all that authority was not what it seemed. They looked unstoppable. They looked like they could do whatever they wanted, like they were the ones in control, like they were the ones calling the shots for their own purposes. But Jesus knew better. He knew the truth of Psalm 2 that Thomas was reading earlier, that the one enthroned in heaven laughs at the plans of the nation. And he says, I have installed my king on my holy mountain. And he says to Jesus, Ask of me and I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession. God is the one. His plans will stand. Even when all of the powers of earth line up in opposition to him, they cannot succeed. They cannot even slow him down. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. There's no contest. It doesn't matter how things look on the ground, this reality is always true. And we've got to remember that when we watch the news. And we've got to remember that when we see the threats and dangers around us, whether they're big threats, global threats, or whether they're personal threats that only ourselves are experiencing, the truth that God is on the throne, that God is the ultimate authority, will keep us from panicking. Like we see with Jesus here, he faced this very serious threat from a powerful ruler. He did not panic. His course was set. He had complete confidence that the plan that would be carried out was not Herod's plan, it was God's plan. I will keep on driving out demons and healing people today and tomorrow, and on the third day I will reach my goal, he says. My goal, not Herod's. He had work to do for the kingdom of God. He knew that the powers of earth could not stop God from working in his plan, even if they killed him, as he knew they would. He kept right on healing and delivering people. And on the third day, he reached his goal, which the phrasing here points us to what Jesus' goal really was. Because we know Jesus was raised on the third day. Jesus is using this phrase in advance. He's pointing forward not only to arriving in Jerusalem, but to the work that he would accomplish there. The completion of salvation, the work of dying in our place for our sins, rising again in victory over sin and death, to give life to the people who trust in him. Harry can have whatever plans and whatever desires he wants to have. He can have all the power and authority that comes with being a king. But one thing he can never do is derail God's plan. No one can. And that is still true today, no matter how powerful and influential people are, and no matter how hard they try to fight against God's purposes in the world, or fight against God's purposes in your own life. If you belong to God, they can never succeed. Amen? Amen. There is no threat, there is no danger that can keep God's promises from coming true. This is the confidence that Jesus had, and we can have that same confidence as well if we belong to him. Jesus knew that God had promised him an inheritance of the nations, as we saw in Psalm 2. He knew that nothing could stop that from happening. And yet he also knew that the way that that would happen was that um, 
they would carry out their plans to put him to death. Jesus went to Jerusalem in confidence, knowing that God's plan would be accomplished, um, but actually that it would be through his death that that plan would be accomplished. He knew that they would kill him, but he knew that God would use what they meant for evil to accomplish the greatest good that the world had ever seen. His goal was not to avoid immediate danger to himself. He went straight into the danger. And he went there confidently because he knew that that was the way to accomplish God's plan. That's not recklessness. That's not carelessness. That's not foolish overconfidence. This is a life that is directed at the kingdom of God, not at the priorities and goals that, we, that people have on earth. There were times when Jesus did slip away from crowds um, that were trying to kill him because it wasn't his time yet. When he was a baby, God told Joseph and Mary to flee to Egypt until the former king, King Herod, had died. So there are times when um, precautions are, are made, when, when those things are good and right, but there are also times when avoiding the immediate threat is not the right response, when he drove straight into the danger. And we see that here, and we see that other times in Scripture, that people would go straight into the threat, straight into the danger, because obedience to God is more important than simply preserving comfort and safety at all costs, for the sake of having comfort and safety. Because for them, the priorities of heaven were more important than anything they might lose on earth. I mean, if you think about it, what if Jesus had run away from Herod at this time? What if he had um, run away from Jerusalem when he got this warning to protect his own life and live a little bit longer? That would be a disaster for us. He might have lived a little longer on earth, but that's not why he was here. There was a time he told his disciples in advance that he would die in Jerusalem. He told them what was going to happen. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. He said, never, Lord. This shall never happen to you. And Jesus said, Get behind me, Satan. You are, stum you are stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. See, Peter was trying to preserve Jesus' life, which is usually a good thing. But there were more important things to think about in this case. And many years later, Peter, Peter himself gave his life. He was crucified too because he refused to renounce the kingdom of God in order to extend his life on earth. As he grew to know God better through his life, his primary concerns changed. I wonder what concerns are foremost in your mind today. What are your biggest concerns related to? Are they related to the eternal kingdom of God or the temporary things on earth? However good they are. My friends, we are not here to enjoy the, just the most comfortable and prosperous life we can manage for ourselves. That is not why we're here. We are here as ambassadors of the kingdom of God on earth. And this earth is a spiritual war zone. So don't make it the goal of your life just to accumulate and protect as many good things as you can here on earth. Those things actually can never last anyway. Nothing on earth lasts very long. But God's purposes and God's promises for his children will last, and they will last forever. I'm not saying that we should live recklessly or ignore danger. We don't refuse medicine or cross the street without looking, or we don't even run with scissors. But God didn't give us this life to be careless with it. He gave it for a purpose. But that purpose and the goal of our living is not simply to avoid every threat that there is and every danger that there is. It is not to avoid every criticism or insult or enemy that we could ever uh, come across. God gave us this life and every good gift we have for a reason. And the reason is not to just to hold on to everything we have as tightly as possible for as long as possible. The reason God gave us this life is to use it to use it and everything we have, to love him and to love the people he made and to do as much good as we can in service to our king. 
That absolutely does mean that we take reasonable precautions and protections so that we can serve God as long and effectively as possible. But it also means that protect, protecting ourselves is never the ultimate goal. If you're following Jesus, you can navigate this life with confidence, not fear, even in the face of serious threats and dangers. When you see the threats, you can see them realistically. You can use the wisdom God gives to respond appropriately, but you don't have to change the direction of your life. Keep your eyes focused on what God has called you to do as his ambassador and child. The, the threats might even come true. You might actually lose things on the path of following Jesus. Your friends and family might actually turn against you. Your company might not promote you. People might see you as odd, or maybe God will lead you through difficulties, through sickness, through disaster, through terrible losses. There are times when God puts his children in those circumstances, and he has good reasons for doing so, but sometimes we can't see those reasons. There are times when God purposefully leads us through the valley of the shadow of death, as David put it. But even there, David says, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. God doesn't leave his children in the valley of the shadow of death. He leads us through it. He leads us through to the other side, which is full of the richness of all of his good promises. Forever you prepare a table before me and bless me. God knows what he's doing. He knows where he's going when he leads us. And we can trust him. Jesus saw this threat against him, but he kept his eyes on the kingdom of God and what he had to do. He knew that his work for the kingdom of God was what mattered most, even more than life itself. His life was not just about gathering up as many good things as he could for himself on earth and holding on to them for as long as possible. His life had a goal. His life had a reason. He was moving forward, even in the threats, because he knew where he was going. And we see a glimpse of that reason, that goal, in verse 34 and 35. He laments over Jerusalem. He says, Jerusalem, you have killed the prophets and stolen those sent to you. How often I have longed to gather your children together, as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. And you were not willing. Look, your house is left to you desolate. I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Why was Jesus going to Jerusalem, knowing that he would die there? Going straight into the threat. Look at verse 34. Jesus says to Jerusalem, a city of people who constantly rebelled against God, who killed so many of his prophets over the years. Prophets that God had sent to warn them and call them back to himself. A city that he knew would actually kill him as well. And yet Jesus doesn't say, he doesn't say, I, I can't wait until you get what you deserve for all the betrayal and all the pain you've caused me. No, what he says is, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. What a picture. What a picture of closeness and protection. God's desire for his rebellious people is to bring them close to himself, under his wings, under his protection and care, even after all that they've done against him. And this is why Jesus went to Jerusalem, knowing what the threat was, knowing it would come true. He knew that the only way for God to accomplish this desire to bring people close to himself was for him to go and to die for our sin in our place and rise again so that he could offer a new life. So that he could actually gather his children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. That is very hopeful because it shows God's desire for sinful people to be close to him. But this is also a warning. This is a lament for those who refuse to come. Israel was not willing to come to God. And as a result, he says, your house is left to you desolate. 
This is the terrible end of all sin. And it's sadly ironic because the ones who were left desolate with nothing, they rejected Jesus in a real attempt to protect themselves and to hold on to all the good things that they had, all the things that they enjoyed on earth. And yet in trying to protect themselves and hold on to the, those things, they actually lost everything. Think about it. Many in Jerusalem wanted to kill Jesus, but why? Well, because Jesus was a threat to them. He was a threat to their accumulated power and authority. They were working to protect the good things that they had, the good things that they enjoyed, their position, their wealth, their status, their security, the same kinds of things that we so often try to protect ourselves. They wanted to hold on to all those things, and so they refused to let go of their control and recognize God's Messiah because if they recognized him, they would have to give up their claim to power and control. And they were afraid they might lose the things that they loved. And you know what? They might, they might have lost the things that they loved. Some of those things they would have lost. They would have lost control. Because when we give up ourselves to God, we do give up control. We do have to hold everything he gives with open hands, willing to let him give what he decides to give, what he knows is best, and take what he knows needs to be taken, willing to let him be in charge of what we have and what we do, not us. But what the people of Jerusalem did not see is that it is only by giving ourselves and everything we have to God that we can ever actually keep the good gifts that God gives by rejecting God and holding so tightly to what they had, Jerusalem was left desolate. And the same is true for us. Our control is an illusion. Our grip can never be tight enough to hold the good things we enjoy on earth. They will be lost eventually. And if we insist on holding on to them ourselves, we will lose them all. But if we entrust them to the Lord, we have his goodness forever. There is hope, even for rebellious people. In verse 35, Jesus says, You will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That phrase, yeah, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, it's a recognized messianic welcome. It is a saying used to welcome the Lord's king to reign over his people. And people said that in the triumphal entry when Jesus came into Jerusalem, but the city didn't actually welcome him then. That was the time when the city and its leaders actually turned against him and killed him. And yet, even in that, God's plan was not sidetracked. It was not derailed. God accomplished salvation through even that. And he set Jesus on the throne above every king, above every kingdom for all of eternity so that one day, uh, that the day will come when he is welcomed into his creation and his people genuinely, re genuinely respond by shouting this welcome, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That is the kingdom that will last. This is the life that lasts. This is the treasure that lasts. And for those who welcome Jesus as their king and savior, there is no threat there is no danger that can take this promise away from us. Jesus refused to seek safety or comfort above his work for the kingdom of God because he knew that earthly safety and comfort, every good thing we enjoy here, is only temporary anyway. He was living for something much bigger than just the best he could do for himself here and now. And I want to ask you this morning, what are you living for? Is the goal of your life to gather as many good things as you can for yourself right now and hold on to them for as long as you can manage to hold on to them. My friends, God made you for more than that. He didn't make you just to enjoy his gifts for a little while on earth. He made you to enjoy knowing himself. The God of the universe wants to bring you close to himself for eternity. If you try to hold on to the gifts and push the giver away, then the gifts will eventually slip through your fingers. You will be left desolate. 
The threats and dangers will come, and eventually all will be lost. But it doesn't have to be that way. Jesus made a way for you to come close to him, to gather you to himself, under his care and protection. The question for you, like the people of Jerusalem, is, are you ready? Will you come? If you do, you can live with the same confidence that Jesus had, even in the face of the most serious threats on earth, because nothing can steal God's promises from his children. Jesus says in Matthew 16, for when whoever wants to save their life will lose it. Whoever loses their life for me will find it. If you give up your life to God, then you will find real life in Him. Life that is absolutely secure for all of eternity. Long after every pleasure and achievement on earth has faded away. Long after every threat and danger is long past. Have you experienced this kind of confidence in your life? It does not come from holding tighter to the things that we have, from holding on to them as, as hard as we can. It can never come from that. This kind of confidence only comes from letting go, giving up your life and everything you have to God and trusting it all to Him. What are you holding on to today? What are you afraid of losing? Are you afraid of losing your health, or your reputation, or your friends, or your career advancement, or something else? Are you ready to bring that thing to God, whatever it is, and actually give up control to the true King? Come under His wings for protection. I'm not going to tell you that you won't lose anything here and now. You very well may. In fact, you may even lose everything. Jesus went to Jerusalem knowing he would, in fact, lose everything, even his life. And yet he went in full confidence, knowing that on the other side of that loss, much more will be gained. Are you ready to put everything you have in God's hands? And trust his promise fully? Are you ready to let him take what he needs to take and give what he decides to give and trust that his promise for you is more secure than anything you can hold on to on earth? You can trust him. You can open your hands. You can live with the same confidence that Jesus had no matter what the threat is. Yes, we live with wisdom, we live with care, but we also live with confidence. Because if we belong to God, your life has a purpose that is bigger than the things you have on earth. Bigger than what other people think of you. Bigger than your family dynamics your, or your level of influence over others or your title at work or your bank balance or your housing situation or all of the, that. You could lose all of that. You could lose more. You could even lose your life. And yet if your life has been lived for God and his kingdom, your treasure in heaven is secure. Your place in God's family gathered to him as a hen gathers her chicks is secure for all time. So when the threats come, you don't have to be afraid. You can look them in the eye like Jesus did and keep your course set for the kingdom of heaven. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that when Jesus faced these threats, he did not change his course. He followed you even through that and won us life. We thank you that he won for us all of your good promises, including the wonderful promise in, in Romans 8, that all things, all things work together for good for those who love God and are called according to your purpose. Lord, let us hold on to you. Let us see our lives as more than just enjoying temporary pleasures on earth, but as part of your eternal kingdom. And let us live for you, Lord. And please, Lord, give us this perspective. 
we would not fear the threats and dangers of earth, that we would find our confidence in you and in your promises. We pray it in Jesus' name. We'll be done. I'll just, I'll just dismiss you with this. Um, may the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face shine on you, be gracious to you.